much more than ordinary lives. It's time for us to more than just survive. We were made to thrive. We were made to thrive. We about if it wasn't for that day that Jesus sat the 12 of us down. It was a busy morning. We were all doing the business of his ministry. We were running errands, talking to the townspeople. And then he, um, he pulled us aside that afternoon in a quiet place. He spoke for a long time. There were no stories, there were no parables. He just spoke plain, painstakingly plain. <sighs> the bottom line was this. He told us if we were to continue following him, things were gonna get dicey for us. That there could even be physical harm when we mentioned his name. He was not painting a pretty picture. But we all knew that uh, this is going to be the price for carrying out his message. I put on my bold, bold, brave face and I nodded in agreement. But inside, I mean, I'm a tax collector, not a soldier. I, I don't know anything about courage or bravery. I couldn't be more ordinary. And I remember thinking, I wonder if Jesus knows how scared I am right now. Not a sparrow falls, he said, that is not in the Father's care. And how much more are we worth? But it's this. It's this that got me. He said to us, if anyone does some simple act of kindness to us, his followers, even like a, giving us a, a cup of cold water, they will not lose the reward. That's how much he cared for us. If someone shows a simple act of kindness, even in the worst scenario, it meant something in heaven. Jesus said on the cross, I thirst. And that same cup of water he mentioned, we couldn't even give it to him. He was willing to die painfully, thirsty even, for our sake. And because of that, my courage grew. Not out of bravery, but from love. Two weeks in a row, my dogs had to get up and go get a drink of water during the video. I don't know what's going on with him, but anyways, uh, I was just thinking as I was watching that video that um, we could maybe have a unique fundraiser for the church. It's, it's hard for people to get their donations in and their tithes and offerings in. And, and so I thought, okay, well, what can we do to try to increase some revenue? Because quite frankly, the bills still come in, even if the doors are closed. And I thought, I know what I'll do. We'll raffle off toilet paper. What do you think? Um, 
I think we'd go as high as 20 bucks a roll. Maybe. You think so, Jerry? Absolutely. <laughs> um, who knew that this would become one of the most sought after and most difficult things to find around here? One of the most valuable things, even perhaps more valuable than gold. But you know, as bad as it is, it could always be worse. We can live without toilet paper. And I might just have to figure out how to do that if this lasts a few more days. But there are things in this world that we can't live without. This is one of them. It's tough to live without toilet paper, but it's impossible to live without water. Without water, we can live only a few days at most. You know, surrounded by the Great Lakes, it might be hard for us to understand just how important water is to us. We have the Great Lakes around us. We enjoy the modern conveniences of indoor plumbing. And it's just something that we take for granted. If you've ever been really thirsty, though, you know just how bad it is. The most thirsty time I've ever experienced in my life was when I was about, I would say, 14 or 15. I didn't have my license back then, but I did have a bike. And my best friend, Ken Grinnell, and I, we hopped on our bikes because Ken had said, hey, you want to go fishing? So I said, sure. We grabbed our bikes, grabbed our fishing rods, and off we went. And so we made the journey from Stovall, where I grew up, uh, to Whitevale. And... It's about a 15 kilometer trip. So on the bike, it takes maybe 45 minutes or so. It's a pretty straight trip down a country road on the gravel side of the road. A little bit dusty, but that's okay. When we got there, we went down this nice little path. We got to this dam and I clearly remember watching the fish that were spawning at that time. And so they were trying to to uh, go down river, but they were at this little dam and they were trying to navigate this obstacle. And, um, and, and it was just a really cool thing. And then as soon as we got on our bikes, Ken Grinnell's tire popped and our hearts deflated too, because we realized that we had no help around us. This is back before cell phones were even a thing. They were only in cars and only owned by the wealthy. So what did we do? Well, we headed home. And so we started to walk the 15 kilometer journey. I looked it up on Google. Google says it's a three hour walk. When you're carrying slash trying to push a bike with the deflated tire, it's more than a three hour walk. And the thing is, it was a hot August day. It had to have been at least 35 degrees, not a cloud in the sky. And you know those hot, muggy, humid Ontario summer days, it was one of those. And so as we started to walk, we realized that neither of us had brought any water, not a drop, because we were 15. It's like, we'll go 15 kilometers on our bikes, fish for a few hours, drive our bikes back, and then get some water when we get home. After about two hours, we were so thirsty. At the three hour mark, our, our throats were dry, our muscles began to ache. It was just a terrible scenario. And we walked by this golf course and the sprinklers were going in the golf course. And I can still remember it so clearly. We really thought about climbing the fence and just trying to get our faces in these sprinklers to drink from the water. But then Ken said, wait, maybe there's pesticides in the water <laughs> or, or something to help grow the grass. And so we didn't and on we walked, just wanting nothing more than a glass of water. There was not a thing in that world that mattered more to us over those hours than a glass of water. So I think about that because it happened 30 years ago and I can't remember being that thirsty ever since. I mean, I remember on a couple of road trips where we accidentally passed the, the stop for the Tim Hortons, the, the en route. And so we had to wait another 50 kilometers to get to the next one, and I was pretty thirsty there. But nothing like that day. I would wager that in Jesus' day, they experienced thirst far more often than we do today. With 
indoor plumbing and modern treatment plants, surrounded by the Great Lakes as we are, we have the ability to just pull over and get a a double-double anywhere we want. Thirst is just something that we don't understand. And I think that if you're in Jesus' day and you can't just pull over and get a double-double at the Tim Hortons between Jericho and Jerusalem, I think that they really valued clean drinking water more than we ever could understand. And so Jesus, he talked a lot about water. Remember that time that he was hanging out by a well? And a Samaritan woman came up to him and he said, hey, could you get me a drink of water? And then she sort of looked at him and and she said, why would you ask me for a drink of water? I'm a Samaritan. You're Jewish. We don't hang out. We don't get along. Like, it's inappropriate what you're doing. And what's his reply? He says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, You would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. I'm just asking for a cup of water, Jesus says. And and yet, if you asked me for a drink, I could give you eternal water, water that would never run out, a drill, a well that would never go dry. In the book of Revelation, we have God saying this to John. It is done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. And in Matthew, we read, And whoever gives one of these little ones even even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. So out of all of these images that Jesus uses to describe who he is and what he does, water is one of the more prominent and easiest to grasp. After all, I'm sure that every single one of us knows at some point in our life what it was like to be thirsty. Your throat begins to get dry. Your tongue starts to itch. Your muscles begin to ache. Fatigue sets in. Just moving forward step by step is a painful task. Even your eyelids can begin to burn. And every single thought that you have is for water. Now, spiritually speaking, Jesus uses the image of water to describe who he is and what he does so often because Jesus is a cold glass of water on a hot day. He's that clean, clear well in the desert. He's that cold running hose in your garden when you're six years old and you're playing the sprinkler on a hot August day. That hose that quenches your thirst. Now, I came to Christ when I was 16 years old. And, and I came out of an unchurched home uh, good people, got, uh, wonderful people, just not churchgoers. And, and uh, I remember that moment when I prayed and received Christ in my life. I was at Bingham and Park, and this guy named Dewey led us in the sinner's prayer, and he prayed it along with him. Lord Jesus, cleanse me of my sin. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. And I felt this weight lift off of me, a weight that I, I didn't even notice before. And I also felt somehow clean and renewed. I, I could feel the, the grace of Christ flooding into my life, and I could feel like he's just cleaning out all that sin, all that grime, all that dirt, all that gunk, just washing it away. And after it was washed away, I felt this renewed vitality. I just felt energized and also confused and a little bit scared because it came out of nowhere for me. But but I, I'll never forget how, how it changed me that day. That's what Christ does. He cleanses us from sin and all unrighteousness. And he renews us and gives us a new vitality. My dog Spike, who's now in the sunroom with my wife and youngest son Paxton, is uh, 17 years old. And, and the poor guy, I mean, he, 
he's just living every ounce of life that he has left. We um, called up the vet a few weeks ago and we said we think he's coming to the end of his journey and we actually made an appointment to have him, well, promoted to glory because all dogs go to heaven, right? And, um, and because of all of what's going on, we've had to cancel that appointment and, you know, actually I'm kind of relieved about it in a way. But a few days ago, we said we need to do something about Spike because he's stinky and he's dirty and he's uncomfortable. So my wife took him upstairs, gave him a bath, washed him down, scrubbed him down, cleaned out his ears, trimmed him up, gave him a, a bit of a haircut. And, and then he came downstairs soaking wet um, in a towel. She put him down on the ground and he just started running laps around the house, barking, dancing, rubbing up against things, growling. For the next two hours, he just had this renewed vitality from the bath that he had had. He, he felt clean and fresh and revived, maybe a little angry, I don't know. But this bath gave Spike a new vitality, a new energy. It renewed his spirit. Now, the next day, he didn't move. I think that really wore him out. But for that time, that, that water, that water had healing properties. I mean, why else does Jesus use water so often to refer to who he is and what he does? Because he cleanses us from sin, and, and, he, and he refreshes us and quenches our thirst and gives us a new vitality. He sustains us. And in a, in a day like today... In, in a moment like right now where the thunder and the lightning is out and we're all seemingly quarantined to our homes and we don't know what's going to go on, boy, do we need, boy, do we need that refreshment more than ever. I'll tell you. You know, the Apostle Paul, he's talking about marriage in Ephesians chapter 5. But he likens uh, the relationship between what Jesus does and the church in this way. And I thought I'd share it with you. Jesus gave himself up for her, that's the church, to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. It's interesting, even, even Paul picks up on the image of water and how it represents who Jesus is and what Jesus does. I mean, water is just such a, a clear picture of this that we, we use literal water in baptism, right? We, we actually dunk people in water. I mean, that's how effective this image is. And from Acts 22, what are you waiting for? is said to this person who's come to a realization of faith, get up, be baptized, wash your sins away, calling on his name. And so here's what we find, that Jesus does a few things. First of all, this image shows us that Jesus washes away our sin. It shows us that, that Jesus quenches our spiritual thirst. And, and maybe some of you are joining us for the first time. You haven't been to church in years, and, and yet... All of this has brought about a spiritual thirst in you, and that's good. You're, you're coming to the right source. You're going to the right well for this. Just like that woman at the well, she, she had a spiritual thirst that Jesus satisfied. After they'd had their conversation, she dropped her bucket, didn't even get a drink of water, it seems, ran off to the village and said, hey, come, come see this guy because he knows everything. You've got to meet him. And that's what I want to say to you. You need to meet Jesus, because I'll tell you, that event when I was 16 has completely changed my life. But it doesn't end there. Not only does Jesus cleanse us from sin and quench our spiritual thirst, he also literally quenches our thirst. You know, it's easy to over-spiritualize who Jesus is and what he came to do, but his mission, his heart's desire is not just spiritual enlightenment or an existential faith moment. That's a big part of it. And Jesus spends a lot of his time talking about it, but there's something more. Jesus actually spent a lot of his time literally feeding the hungry, literally quenching the thirst of those 
who are thirsty. And sometimes he even turned that water into wine as a bonus. Great guy. Dear church, he calls us to do the same. He calls us to do the same. As followers of Christ, we're called to reflect who he is and to show others what he is and what he does by carrying out his mission, by doing the kinds of things that he did. And that includes preaching and teaching. That includes worship and baptism and communion. But it also includes quenching the thirst of those who are thirsty and feeding the tummies of those who are hungry. Now, Knox has an amazing soup kitchen. So many, like a dozen or more committed volunteers who put on a great meal every week. And, and the first week um, of all of this going on, the soup kitchen still ran and they were trying to figure out what they should do. So they're torn because in this moment, there are going to be more people than ever who need support. Literal food, literal water. Um, but also, how do you maintain social distancing? And so after a while, they realized they didn't know quite how to do it, and they decided to close. Well, a few people got wind of this. One in particular, Vernice Smith, she said, I think we can do something different. So she rallied a few people, uh, the Wooten Radcos, for example, and, and they got a bunch of bottles of water. They got some fruit, I think, and some cookies, and, and they made sandwiches. And then, and then Vernice went to the parking lot outside Knox at 10.30 last Tuesday with a mask on and her gloves on, and she handed out, well, you can see the lunch right here that they prepared. She handed out over 30 of those. Some people came even by taxi. They were so hungry. They were willing to spend their money on a taxi to come and get this food. And, and then the rest that were left over, she had 40 lunches she gave away to some clients that she had who were in need. And then between then and now, She's partnered with Randy and the Lions Club, and the Lions Club is going to help out. So this Tuesday, the soup kitchen will be open. Even if nobody goes in the building, we will be handing out lunches. And I, and I just think that, that is absolutely amazing. So Jesus is the thirst quencher in so many ways, both spiritually and literally. But who quenches Jesus' thirst? For as he was on the cross, knowing that all was completed, and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I thirst. I thirst. It was just a single word in the Greek. In the Greek, it's dipsao. But translated, it's either I am thirsty or I thirst in English. And although it's just one small word, dipsao, it's a word that has tremendous significance. After hanging on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., six hours of agony, he finally communicates that he, the Son of God, Need something to drink. And what does it say about our Savior that it's not until after six hours into the crucifixion that he even mentions his own needs? Now we're in week five of this series, The Last Words of Christ, and in that first week we get our very first word, which is, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And here is a word of petition from Jesus to his heavenly Father. Forgive them, Lord. He's interceding on our behalf. He's interceding not on, on my behalf. He's interceding even on the behalf of those who are crucifying him, even on those who put him on trial, even on those who brought him before the judge in the first place, even on behalf of those who whipped him and beat him and drove those nails into his wrists, into his ankles. The second word is this, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. This is a word of assurance or comfort 
to the thief on the cross. This, this is a word saying to him, it's okay. You've, you've lived a hard life. You've made bad choices. They've all come full circle on you, but today you will be with me. And when you're with me, you're in paradise. The third word is a wonderful moment between a mom and her son. Woman, behold your son. And then he said to the beloved disciple, behold your mother. This is a word of provision for his family. Just please take care of my mom. And of course, we know it's a it's an image of the church because through him, we now are all brothers and sisters, mothers, sons, fathers, and daughters. And that's what he does. Jesus becomes our brother. The fourth word, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? These are words of encouragement to his followers memorized right out of Psalm 22. It might seem like it's not a word of encouragement, but remember that Psalm 22 ends with God is not far off. God is in this. God will rescue me. God will bring good out of this bad situation. And he's drawing everyone's attention to Psalm 22. Like it looks like everything is going down the chute, but it's not. God is here and he's active in the midst of our struggle. He's doing something. And Jesus in agony with the last few breaths he has is encouraging those who have ears to hear and is encouraging even our hearts today, 2,000 years later. And then we get to the fifth and the final word, I thirst. It's not until now, six hours later, that Jesus finally talks about his own physical needs. Let me just think about that. What a, what a great model that would be for our marriages or our friendships or interactions, any relationship really, what would these relationships look like if before we expressed our own needs, we listened and we met the needs of others? I mean, just think of how transformative that would be. That is the way of Christ. And I can't help but think about the doctors and the nurses and the gas station attendants and the bankers and the grocery store clerks who are all out there right now on the front lines putting others first. I know it might not seem like it, but you are, you are appreciated. You are. So this week, I, I broke my ankle. If you're, not, if you're new to Knox, you won't know that, but I, I broke my ankle four or five weeks ago, and I went down on Monday to the Aurelia Hospital, and normally I'd just go in this nice little door off to the side to the fracture clinic, get an x-ray, see how things are going. And we got there, and it was all locked down. And like, okay, and there's signs there. No, you can't come in. So we, we found the main entrance, and, and as we pulled up, we looked and we saw two women in full protective gowns, plastic shield, masks on, arms folded, looking kind of intimidating. And, uh, and I got out there, got on my crutches, and Nikki brought out a wheelchair and, and wheeled me in. And, uh, and it turned out they were the nicest people ever. <laughs> this one woman, she wheeled me all the way down to the fracture clinic and, and I met another nurse behind the desk in the whole same situation. And, and at first, I was a little bit intimidated. In fact, I felt a little bit offended, like, like I'm not some kind of leper, you know. Um, but here's the thing. It could have been. It could be a carrier. They don't know where I've been from. They have no idea. So they're taking the steps they can to protect themselves. But you want to know what? They were there. They were there. They're still putting themselves at risk. And I think of the you know, 20-year-old single mom stocking toilet paper at the no frills. She's putting herself at risk so that we can, well, you know. There are, there are people who are being as safe as they can possibly be, but they're still out there putting others first. That, whether they know it or not, is the way of Christ.
dear friends. If you are one of those people, thank you. You may, you may not even have a handle on this whole Jesus thing, but he's working through you and in you, and you are modeling who he is and what he does, and, and that is absolutely amazing. We know that as followers of Jesus Christ, we have our thirst quenched by Jesus. Look at what, what Jesus said about this in, in John 7. I have to share this with you. Jesus stood up and he cried out, If anyone thirsts, let them come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. And so as we wrap up today, I just want to point out one small thing, that, that Jesus becomes a source of life and vitality that empowers us to quench the thirst of others. Not, not only does he meet our needs, not only does he give us eternal water, eternal refreshment, but then he empowers us on his behalf to do the same. It's sort of like, like Jesus pours and, and pours and pours his, his life into us. And then whatever spills over just refreshes everybody around us. And this well will never go dry. As he says, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. And what do rivers do? Well, rivers flow and they feed the lakes, and they refresh the people who drink from them. You see, our thirst is quenched, dear church, so that we can quench the thirst of others. I know that things are rough right now. I know the economy is uncertain. I know the future is uncertain. We had to cancel a, a trip to Disney, and we were supposed to leave. Like, honestly... Like, soon. <laughs> like an hour from now, we were supposed to leave. And at, at 5 o'clock in the afternoon, we were going to be in Buffalo on an airplane heading to Florida. Um, actually, we weren't going to Disney this time. We were just going to Florida, hang out with my in-laws, enjoy some sun, swim by the pool, take the kids to the beach, relax and get away before the busyness of Easter. And my wife is so bummed. <laughs> I mean, she, she's been using this to get her from Christmas to now just to get through the winter. And we've had to cancel that. But I mean, there are others who aren't just canceling plans, they're losing jobs. Some people have relatives who are sick. We don't have a lot of cases of COVID-19 here, but, but I mean, we do. And of course, there's a lot of people who are stressed out, feeling trapped in their homes, losing their minds. It's a tough time. We need the refreshing of God more than ever so that we can look around us and be that for others. Whether it's just checking up on a, an elderly neighbor, calling or emailing someone that you know might really be struggling with this. Maybe it's leaving some food. I had a good friend, Charlene, bring cake by the door and leave it on the porch yesterday. And that was just a wonderful little gesture, a little pick-me-up of community and connectedness and, and being, being thought of. In this time, there's just so many little ways that we can help out each other. And, uh, and so we remember that, no, oh, I didn't put it in. We remember that Jesus washes away our sin. He quenches our spiritual thirst. And then he literally quenches our thirst. And so how can we as the church do the same? How can we spiritually encourage people? Like you can find refreshment spiritually in Jesus. And, and how can we literally feed them, water them as it were? I think that's a question that I'll be answering myself over the next few weeks, especially as we're doing it in a different way. Now I want to just bring us back to Jesus and that question that statement, I thirst. When he said that, they looked around, they saw a jar full of sour wine. It's the kind of, the, of wine that the soldiers would have had that they would have drank. It would have been 
really, really the cheap stuff. Like the really, really cheap stuff. They put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and they held it to his mouth and he drank. And this fulfilled an ancient prophecy repeated more than once, but I'll just share it here from Psalm 69. Actually found also in the Psalm that we looked at last week. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. But you know, this the sour wine would moisten Jesus' throat so that he could utter the last two words from the cross. I don't think he was just looking for something to drink. I think he was looking for the ability to speak, because even now he's thinking about others. He's got more to say to those who are gathered around him at the cross, and he's got more to say to you and me. So I hope that you can join us over the next couple weeks as we continue to look and explore, look at and explore the final words of Jesus from the cross, because they mean so very much to us, and they mean so very much to a thirsty world that needs to be quenched. Let us pray.